I have a bit of a dilemma. My friend, Honest Pete, there he is on screen. Lovely, lovely guy. We like to play games of chance. Lately, at his suggestion, it's been a lot of coin flipping games, but he's been winning a lot. So I need your help to figure out if this coin of his, if it's fair or if it's a little bit dodgy. Now, I guess there are two possible conclusions I can come to at the end of all of this, but since Honest Pete and I are mates, I kind of want to give him the benefit of the doubt. So my initial viewpoint is going to be that Honest Pete's coin is indeed fair. This is essentially my baseline view and is known in the world of statistics as the null hypothesis. Think of this idea as Pete essentially being innocent until proven guilty. But then I also have my suspicion, in other words, the idea I want to test, and that is that the coin is not fair. In hypothesis testing, this opposing viewpoint is known as the alternate hypothesis. Now my aim with all of this is to figure out which idea or which hypothesis is most likely based on what we observe. But I don't want to just accuse Pete of, shall we say, skullduggery, uh, unless I have a good amount of evidence to back that claim up. So here is my plan. As we're mates, I'm gonna give Pete the benefit of the doubt and I'm gonna start by assuming that this, the null hypothesis, is true. I'm gonna assume the coin is fair, but by doing this, I'm also assuming that Pete's coin will behave in the way a fair coin should. I will only be swayed from this viewpoint that the coin is fair if I observe some outcome that would be so unlikely with a fair coin that it seems implausible that that is actually the case. And if that happens, I will start to think that this is actually more likely to be true, that Pete is up to no good with that coin. But at what point will I make that temporal switch? In other words, how much evidence will I need before I make that decision? decision. I need to quantify this. So let's think about it on a scale of likely to unlikely. And this will be in terms of the probability that we'd see the particular outcome that we see if the coin was indeed fair. Let's essentially draw a line in the sand. If Pete manages to achieve some outcome with his coin that had a probability of 5% or less, so a pretty unlikely event, let's say that if that happens, we'll somewhat change our mind and move toward the alternate hypothesis that the coin is not fair. But until that does happen, we'll more or less accept that we don't have enough evidence to prove it's anything but fair. So here we go. Let's say Pete flips the coin once and it is a head. If Pete's coin was a fair coin, we would expect this to happen half of the time, right? Or 50% of the time. So thinking back to our likelihood spectrum, this would sit, say, here. A 50% chance means this outcome is pretty likely. At this point, I'm feeling pretty relaxed about everything. I don't have any good reason at this stage to doubt the null hypothesis that the coin is fair. Now, Pete flips a second time, and it is again a head, so two in a row. The chance of this happening randomly, if the coin is indeed a fair coin, is 25%, still pretty likely. So that would sit here. Less likely than one head in a row, but still nothing to raise suspicion. Perhaps at most, enough to raise an eyebrow. And since 25% is still well above that 5% threshold that I set, I'm still holding the view that the null hypothesis is the most likely scenario. But then Pete flips another head, so three in a row. Well, let's think about this. If the coin was fair, there is still a random chance of 12.5% or 1 in 8 that this would happen. So back to our spectrum, I'm still not really ready to accuse Honest Pete of trickery at this point. A 12.5% chance is still higher than that 5% threshold I set. But now, perhaps we could say that I'm a little intrigued. Then, wouldn't you know it, Pete flips another head. We're now talking four in a row. This is becoming much less likely. If the coin is truly a fair coin, we should only see this around 6% of the time. While by our own rules, we are still giving Pete and his coin the benefit of the doubt, this has more than likely piqued our interest. And then Pete flips another head. We're now talking five heads in a row. And this 
goes past the initial threshold that I set, which means that Pete and I, we need to have a little talk because if this coin truly was a fair coin, this situation getting five heads in a row is super unlikely. At least it's less likely than I'm happy to accept. And because of that, now I really doubt that initial assumption, that benefit of the doubt that I gave him that the coin was fair. And I start to be much more comfortable around that opposing assumption that the coin is actually rigged. Okay, so while Pete and I are no longer chums, sorry you had to watch that play out, I actually have some good news. You now know exactly how a hypothesis test works and what's more than that, you now know exactly what a p-value is. If you don't believe me, let's recap. So a hypothesis test requires three things. Firstly, we essentially need some sort of baseline view of what might be going on and this is what is known as the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is where we state our initial viewpoint and in statistics and specifically hypothesis testing, our initial viewpoint is always that there is no difference or effect. In other words, what we're observing is purely by chance. To quickly step away from our example with Honest Pete and his coin, if we were testing for changes in health for people who took a drug versus those who took a placebo, the null hypothesis would be that there's no difference in the resulting health between those two groups, that the drug had no effect versus the placebo. Back to my former friend, Honest Pete, our null hypothesis was that nothing dodgy was going on, or in other words, the viewpoint that Honest Pete's coin was fair. The second thing needed for a hypothesis test is the alternate hypothesis. As we discussed, this is essentially the opposing view to that of the null hypothesis, so that there is a difference or effect in what we are testing. To quickly segue back to our drug versus placebo example, the alternate hypothesis would be that the two groups will see a resulting difference in health, that the drug did have an effect on patient health versus the placebo. For the person that we will from this point on would refer to as dishonest Pete, this was that something untoward is going on with that coin. In other words, that his coin is not fair, that it is somehow biased toward heads rather than being equally likely to land on tails. And finally, the third thing needed for a hypothesis test is an acceptance criteria. And this is the pre-specified threshold that decides the most likely hypothesis. In our example, this was the line in the sand we drew before looking at the data itself. This acceptance criteria can be set to any value we like, but a common convention is 5% like we used here, or what you'll often see written as 0.05. When we then did go and look at the data, the probabilities we saw were compared against this acceptance criteria. If the probability of what we saw was higher than the acceptance criteria, we essentially kept our belief that the null hypothesis was more likely to be true, and when the probability was lower, so when the outcome was very unlikely, we tended our belief more to toward the alternate hypothesis. And all these values, so the acceptance criteria itself and the probability values, these are p-values. And I wanna reiterate one more time exactly what they mean. So a p-value is saying, if the null hypothesis is true, how likely is this result that we're seeing? If we see a high p-value, this means that what we've observed is likely to have occurred if the null hypothesis is true. In other words, the result we're seeing doesn't in any way suggest that the null hypothesis isn't plausible. This is essentially what we saw when Pete rolled one head in a row. Nothing about that scenario gives us any evidence to doubt the null hypothesis. Conversely, if we see a low p-value, this means that what we're observing is unlikely to have occurred if the null hypothesis is true. In other words, we're seeing a result which makes us start to doubt the plausibility of the null hypothesis. An example of this is when Pete had rolled five heads in a row. This seemed pretty unlikely with a fair coin. It started to make us doubt the validity of that statement. Of course, saying all of this, whether we do formally reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis does depend upon where we place our acceptance criteria. So before we wrap up this video, let's spend a moment talking about the most common types of hypothesis tests that you will need to utilize within data science or data analysis. You always want to apply the appropriate test and this will depend on several factors. Firstly, the type of data that you're looking to test and secondly, the question that you are asking. Let's put all of the Honest Pete stuff behind us and for this, I just want you to put yourself in the shoes of an NBA basketball team coach and as coach you want to understand a little bit more about the abilities of your players. Let's start with the type of questions that you might be asking and then note the specific hypothesis test you might look to utilize in order to 
help understand the answer to that question. So the first question that you might ask is, is the mean vertical leap of my team different, higher or lower than the mean of all players in the NBA? Here, because we're comparing a sample, our team to the population that it comes from, all players in the league, we would utilize a test called a one sample t-test. Now in the question there on screen, I've actually specified all of the comparisons we could possibly make. So different, higher and lower. When running the hypothesis test in practice, we would need to specify exactly what question we wanted and we would adapt the test accordingly. Do not worry if this doesn't make sense right now, there is a video dedicated to all of this coming up very soon in this section of the course. Now as the coach of the team the next question that you might ask is is the mean vertical leap of my team different higher or lower than the mean of our rival team? So this is a little bit different we're now comparing one sample our team to another sample the rival team. For this we'd often utilize something called an independent samples t-test. Again there will be a dedicated video for that coming up. Next you ask has the mean vertical leap of my team changed after a targeted four week training program. So imagine that as coach, you put in place a targeted training program for the squad that was primarily aimed at increasing their vertical leap. You would have a distribution of jumping heights for the 30 players in your squad before the program and a distribution of jumping heights for those same 30 players after the training program. We want to compare those before and after figures and get an understanding as to whether any changes are statistically significant or perhaps just down to random noise. And for this, we'd use another type of t-test, the paired t-test. Now, the final question you have as coach is as follows. Is the three point shooting percentage of my newly signed player higher than my current star player. Here we're dealing with a slightly different type of data, a proportion, which is driven by the binary result of players either being successful or unsuccessful with each three point shot attempt. Because we're dealing with proportions here, we need the appropriate hypothesis test. And a common one for this is called the chi-squared test of independence. So there you go, that is hypothesis tests and p-values made easy. I hope this introduction has cleared up exactly what they are and how they work. With this foundational knowledge in place, let's step things up a notch and make this all real. In the next video, we will be discussing and putting into action the one sample t-test. Hypothesis tests are truly one of the most useful things in your toolkit as a data scientist or data analyst. So these next videos are really going to accelerate your career. I cannot wait for this. So I will see you there.